and uh, let's get that um, screen up. Can't find it. All right, is that okay? Can people see that on there? Yeah. 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 Um, right. So this is the um, the next session. This one on uh, Jesus in the wilderness. And um, to introduce, oh, uh, yeah, just to say, I I hope you're okay. If we're just um, slightly more relaxed on the timings, I, I do want to stick to about an hour, hour fifteen, because it can get tiring on Zoom. But um, uh, in the things that Ollie does, he he's and I think he's right. He he offers a two minute pause about halfway through, and then you can stretch your legs and look at something else that isn't the screen and grab you know top up your whiskey or whatever. Um, so we'll just do that after my talk uh, and then come back and then we can we can slightly, you know, um, see how we go with the questions and comments in the show and tell. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Mm. Um, so I thought to introduce this, I'm going to come at it in a slightly different angle. Um, and I, I want to talk about this word indifference. Um, now, let me read a story to you. This is from a book about a sort of wilderness spirituality. It's called The Solace of Fierce Landscapes, Exploring mm -hmm. Desert and Mountain Spirituality by an American professor called Belden Lane. Anyway, um, he has a chapter and he uses this word indifference and he begins his chapter with this story. In December 1935, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry on a mail flight between Paris and Saigon crashed in the Libyan desert west of the Nile. So a, a proper wilderness over a period of three days, um, he walked 124 miles without water through desert sands, stumbling at last half dead into the path of a remote uh, Bedouin caravan. He had been told that no one could survive more than 19 hours in the desert without water. Um, he said after that time, he had been told, the eyes then filled with a ghostly light and death soon followed. But what saved him were two things. First, he was meticulously observant of his surroundings. He noticed an unusual northeast wind full of moisture, and uh, he was able to catch the dew on his parachute silk. Secondly, he remained stubbornly indifferent. So this is this word, indifferent. Stubbornly indifferent to the panic, pain, and despair which preyed on his mind. <coughs> Learning to be fiercely attentive, he also learned not to care, to ignore everything unnecessary, everything unrelated to the primary task of staying alive. So um, the idea is, is that in, in the wilderness, it's difficult. And um, in this case, it was an extreme example. Um, and there are lots of pressures, particularly in the mind, um, telling you what's about to happen. You're going to die. You're not going to survive. You know, panic. And and those who survive are often able to be indifferent to those voices and just focus on exactly what they need to do. Um, this chapter goes on to talk about indifference and uh, the guy defines it as ignoring what doesn't matter so we can focus on what really matters. Mm. Um, so indifference can be a, a negative word, not caring, you know, blasé. Um, some of um, you know teenagers might be a bit indifferent. Some of my own children might be a bit indifferent to things that I maybe wish they weren't. But <laughs> it's not a negative word. It's more that um, you're ignoring what doesn't matter, so you can focus on what really matters. And so this guy, Belden Lane, he just says, "Were Christians to practice this discipline of indifference, they would find a freedom that is refreshing and contagious to some." And people, uh, uh, excuse me, and but also threatening and intolerable to others. Uh, unjust societal structures or unjust people addicted to power will not tolerate being ignored. They're profoundly threatened by those not subject to their influence, those no longer playing by the accepted rules. To cease to be driven by the fear of what other people think is to become a threat to the world as we know it. Um, so he says, actually, if, if we can learn to be uh, indifferent to the right things in order to focus on the right things. It can be like a freedom in our life. So that is uh, a, an idea that I think is in our paintings a little bit. Uh, let me just explain a, a little bit more about it. I hope it's not too um, obscure what I'm saying here. 
Um, I've been trying to learn a bit of chess in the last couple of months because Nelson's uh, started to get interested and um, he's already beating me actually. He's quite good now. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think this idea of indifference is in the chess game as well because if you're an amateur beginner like me, you think I must preserve all my pieces, especially the queen. I can't possibly. But actually, if, you're, if you really know what you're doing and you see how to win the game, you will sacrifice sometimes your most important pieces if it will allow you to capture the king. So in this picture, the small pawn topples the king. Uh, so you're indifferent to what seems to be right because you're absolutely focused on what really matters. Um, this picture was a, a few years ago and I really liked it. Um, can you see in the picture uh, a particular person who is somewhat indifferent to mobile phones? Uh, there is this older lady in the front row and they're watching a parade or something and everybody is trying to make their tech work and they're all focused in on their phones and she is just contentedly actually watching the thing. <laughs> um, so I think she's she's somewhat indifferent to what the crowd are doing and she is just focused on what really matters so I don't know I like that photo do you sort of see uh, some of those ideas how does this relate well I'll, I'll hopefully we'll try and get to that so let's have the reading I'll, I'll just read it uh, Jesus in the wilderness Matthew chapter 4 um, so uh, it actually begins at verse 1 not verse 4 but then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all these kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him uh, <clears throat> i can't resist just doing a little bit of comment about the, ver the verses before we, we get into the paintings and the images um but uh jesus is, is led into the desert to be tempted uh this um story or passage immediately follows his baptism which we looked at last week john the baptist baptizes jesus and then interestingly the spirit sends Jesus off into the wilderness, which is quite a good reminder that when we face hardship or when we're in a wilderness, it doesn't mean that God is absent or that he didn't really want it to happen for our sakes in some way, uh, if his spirit could lead us there. Anyway, uh, there are these three temptations. The devil appears to Jesus after Jesus has fasted for 40 days. So he's potentially weary. And uh, the devil comes at Jesus with three um, temptations at, at different angles. And in each case, Jesus, he doesn't negotiate, he doesn't discuss, he kind of bats them back uh, using the Bible, using scripture. The first temptation is, to, is, is for physical needs, physical hunger. Um, the devil says, uh, look, if you're the son of God, you can turn these um, stones into bread. Um, Jesus not interested in doing that. The, te the next one is a temptation to look for his value and worth uh, to test God. Does God really care for you? If you were to fall, would you be caught? And the third one is the temptation to run after success, whether spiritual or whatever. If you were to worship away from God, something else other than God, you could receive power and wealth and I could give it to you. It says Satan, Jesus won't have it. Um, what I think is interesting is that Jesus actually will get all of the things that the devil throws at him, but he will get it in his own time, in his own way, via the harder road that leads through the cross. So Jesus will get bread. In fact, he will multiply it for thousands. He is the bread of life. He will fall and die, but he will be raised again. And he will sit 
Christians will say. Christians say he will sit and rule over everything as king. So he will get all the kingdoms. He's not going to do it the shortcut way. He's not going to do it the devil's way or Satan's way. He's going to do it, you know, God's way. Um, so uh, there's a little bit about the uh, the story. Um, now, um, let's go to this first painting, which uh, was actually not a painting. It's the um, Byzantine glass mosaic in a cathedral in Italy, in Montreal. Um, and uh, it may have been made about um, 1,175. So this is a very old piece of work. And I think it's part of murals in this cathedral. And, uh, and here is Jesus resisting uh, Satan in the wilderness. Um, now, the, Satan is depicted actually as a winged creature who looks, you know, pretty much like a devil or so on. Uh, I think that um, Katie made a really interesting point last week that maybe for our eyes, it looks, I don't know, a little bit um, obvious, you know, that he, that's obviously the baddie. Uh, and, uh, and maybe we have other ways of trying to depict evil. But I, I expect for, for those people in church, it would have been, a, I hope, an encouragement to see here is Satan depicted. And Jesus is, is obviously in charge in this picture. Jesus is obviously not interested in the temptations and uh, is resolute. Uh, in fact, you could say he is indifferent towards Satan. Uh, he is going to ignore the things that Satan is offering in order to focus on what really, really matters. So uh, just a little bit of uh, what's happening in the uh, image. Um, actually, I have to thank the Tuesday group. They, they really helped us get to grips with it. Uh, somebody uh, knew a bit of Latin. So um, that helped with some of the inscription, which uh, some of you might have already picked out. But the uh, Satan is, is positioned below Jesus. Um, he's dark in color, he's winged. Um, and he's pointing to stones and he's kind of saying, I think he's saying, how about you turn these into bread? And that's what's, I think, in the words above him. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus is standing solid on the ground um, in, a, in a kind of posture of uh, stability. Um, someone on Tuesday made the point that uh, the devil's legs are crossed. If he tried to stand on the ground, he might topple over. It looks a bit unbalanced. Um, and Jesus is looking away. He's focused on something else. Um, he's holding the scriptures, which he's been using to rebuff Satan in his left hand. Um, his hands are crossed. We couldn't quite work out exactly what that meant. Uh, but he's with his right hand. He's sort of palming off Satan. He's like, no, I'm not interested. I'm going to I mean, I'm indifferent to what you're telling me. I'm ignoring that. Um, and uh, he's standing on something firm. We couldn't quite work out if it was rock or whether it was like a, a stump or a, like a tree yeah. um, yeah. with roots, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and behind him is actually a, you know, a living uh, tree. And then more words mm -hmm. that seem to say, um, Pani vive, the bread of life. So Jesus is saying, mm -hmm. or Jesus is the bread of life, even as he rejects Satan's temptation to turn the stones into bread. So there's a little bit about that and i like this i think it's quite good i mm. i um i like the way that um there's a sense of jesus being utterly in in control uh, and i find that um a uh, uh for me as a christian a, a a wonderful idea i think sometimes people imagine that good and evil are locked in a kind of eternal struggle um the, the bible portrays it differently really that jesus has conclusively dealt with evil it doesn't mean that evil isn't present in the world uh, it is, but there's no sense of us having to fear it in a, in a, in a kind of despairing way. Uh, and I, I think that comes across in this here. So next one um, is this one, which is uh, a, a more contemporary painting by somebody called Rose Dahl, uh, painted in 2012. And uh, Jesus is uh, in the wilderness and he's uh, praying, I guess. This is a, a, a prayer shawl around him. Uh, mm -hmm. which uh, someone said was a, a Hebrew prayer shawl called a tallit. And you might put it on when you're going to be in your, you know, quiet place, when you're praying to God as a way to sort of shut out the, um, the noises and uh, temptations or whatever from around. I, I think actually 
I could have done with one of these around the house a bit the last few weeks when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the kids might have been getting a bit much or whatever, you know, something to uh, lock. I suppose headphones do that maybe a little bit. Um, what I, I think is interesting is that um, Jesus is very still. He's very, uh, again, there's a sense of stability. Um, and the, the folds on his shawl in mirror or, or sort of blend into the rocks around him. He's like part of the wilderness and he's, he's, it's kind of saying he's, he's, he's strong. He's the rock. He's stable and unmoved and unchanging. Now, I don't know if you spotted, um, it was very small and probably hard to see on the PDF that I sent you guys, but what's right down here at the foot of Jesus or at his knees by his hands are what looks like three small snakes. Um, and again, snakes is, uh, you know, often a depiction of Satan going back to um, the story of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, where they were tempted by a snake. Uh, but these are, these are small little snakes. They're not huge. Um, they're not sort of massively troubling to Jesus, but they're a nuisance, I think. It, to me, it looks like they're, they're nibbling at his prayer shawl and they might be nibbling at his fingers and getting in the way, a nuisance. And again, there's this idea of indifference, which is that what, what Satan is doing um, isn't necessarily so direct, maybe not as direct as in the first picture, a bit more subtle. Um, and uh, yet Jesus is, is unmoved. Uh, he is indifferent to the little snakes. He is not going to be distracted by them. Um, uh, I don't know what you think of that image, but I, I actually really like this one. I think it's a, a nice one. Um, now, finally, I will say that this one is a bit out of left field, and I think we struggle to get our heads around it a bit on Tuesday, but let's see what we make of this one because it's a different, it's a slightly different idea. It doesn't have Jesus in it at all. Um, this is called The Ambassadors by um, a painter called Hans Holbein, and he went on to paint Henry VIII. So this is sort of in Tudor times, and it's, a, it's an amazing and mysterious and slightly strange painting. I think it's at the National Gallery. Um, in the painting are um, two important men John de Tinterville on the left, who is an ambassador to the court of Henry VIII, and his friend George de Selve on the right, who would go on to become a bishop. And um, they're clad in these sumptuous robes, and they're stationed either side of two shelves um, filled with important and mysterious, curious instruments um, that it represent, if you like, the height of technology in their in their day. Um, they represent progress, sophistication, and wealth and value. So um, if we just zoom in a little bit, here are some of the things uh, in the painting. Um, I had to look this up, obviously. A shepherd's oh. dial, um, a quadrant, a sundial. Uh, they're about control and marking out the world and conquering. And um, if you just look at the painting like that, it just looks like two guys in front of their really great gear. But there's, there's a lot more to this painting, and I don't know if you noticed it. There's something going do on down at the bottom. It looks like a smudge. Um, and it, it's, what, what it is, is, is this, and I'll show you now. I don't know if you've seen this before. Um, it's called, I think it's called an anamorphic picture. And it means that if you look at the picture, from another angle. So if you see in the top right hand corner, if you go to the very edge of the painting and look back at it, um, the, the slanty image comes into focus as a skull and everything else is slanty. Can you see that? Strange, mm -hmm. it's like an optical illusion. Uh, and there's another part of the optical illusion, which is that way up in the top corner, just peeking out from behind the curtain is, uh, is a crucifix of Jesus on the cross. So what does it all mean? People have discussed and debated, and you may have your own ideas. Um, the reason I guess I picked it uh, for, you know, to do with Jesus and, and temptation is that I think there's, a, there's a, some kind of message here that um, the things that we value and we think are important, and they're not bad things, you know, uh, science, progress, all the things that these instruments represent, um, that's... If that's all we're focused on, we may miss 
what is real and true. In the same way that Satan offered things to Jesus that actually uh, were, were genuine temptations. And um, Jesus was able to see a bigger story, a bigger picture, uh, see things from a different angle, maybe. Um, that, that's the kind of idea that I think resonates with this picture. So the skull represents death. And it's as if to say, all of this stuff, which is really great, and these guys and their achievements, they will get old, it will get, it will decay, and death will overtake all of it. it doesn't matter how good it is. That is true. Uh, it's pretty bleak, but it is true. And you kind of have to realize it after the fact when you walk past the picture and then look back and see it at a different angle. And then with Jesus in the crucifix peeking out from behind the curtain, it's as if to say, don't forget what really matters is not any of this stuff here, not the opulence and the wealth, as good or important as that might be for these men, uh, but actually uh, Jesus himself and the way of the cross, his death given for us. So again, I think that slightly ties in with this idea uh, that Jesus was in the desert. He was resisting Satan. He was indifferent to anything else that was not uh, from God in the path that he was to take, uh, which involved um, going to the cross and through it and then to resurrection mm. uh, I don't know if you get any of that from the painting you may have a different take on it um, but there's a few thoughts on those three there and I'll stop if that's okay so um, gather your questions and uh, comments and uh, we'll come back I think we'll give ourselves a couple of minutes just to stretch our legs and uh, top up our uh, cups of tea or whatever and um then we can have a bit of a discussion. Does that sound all right? <laughs>